Nina Lazaro. I'm Anita Weisberg. All right. Anita? Nina, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, myself? Um, I'm from Maryland. I moved to New York about five months ago. I attend Queensborough Community College. Uh, pretty much it. I'm going for liberal arts and then hopefully a major in psychology. Uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Anita Weisbord, born Anita Nagel on March 1st, 1923, grew up in the city of Vienna in Austria. She was raised in a loving Orthodox Jewish home with her parents and her elder siblings, Ernst and Herta. Her father owned a knitting factory while her mother remained home. Anita attended school during the school year, and for the duration of the summer, the Nagels were vacationing. They had a great life. Growing up, Anita had many friends, Jewish and non-Jewish alike. Children are lucky, for they are ignorant to the differences of others. Unfortunately, the children living in Eastern Europe in the 1930s were unable to retain their blissful unawareness for much longer. On March the 13th, 1938, Adolf Hitler marched into Austria. Anita stated simply that after this occurrence, her childhood was brought to a screeching halt. Hitler had been in power since 1933, and in most places where Hitler reigned, he had slowly, over several years, introduced his new regulations, including prohibiting Jews from sidewalks, parks, and schools. Um, in Austria, however, these decrees were instituted within 24 hours. Austrians remained confident that these laws were merely temporary. Their confidence, however, waned on November 9th with the occurrence of Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht was the night in which Nazis broke the windows of Jewish stores and homes, terrorizing the streets and sending the cities and towns into utter mayhem. This was the night that police stormed into Anita's otherwise calm abode and arrested her father, whom was taken to Dachau concentration camp. They stole whatever goods they could get their hands on. Kristallnacht was a significant turning point. Hitler was testing the waters to see how far he could go and how the world would react. Unfortunately, the world remained inactive, and Hitler perceived this as an okay to torture. While the world remained unaffected by the horrid event that was Kristallnacht, Anita's mother realized something must be done. English, England righteously decided to take in Jewish children under the age of 18 to raise them until they were adults so they were out of harm's way. This was identified as the kinder transport. Anita's mother was torn. While she wanted only safety for her children, she was having trouble sending them away. Anita's aunt even criticized her mother, telling her she was a rotten mother for abandoning her children. Anita's mother, however, was certain of her choice, and on March 13, 1939, a year after Hitler first terrorized the streets of Vienna, Anita was sent to England. Imagine being a 15-year-old girl uprooted from her family and everything she knew, dropped in a foreign country where she knew not a word of the language. Anita remembers sitting on the train next to the window, her mother on the other side waiting for her departure. She was mere feet away, but at the same time she was unbelievably distant. This memory haunts Anita, and to this day, she can't bear to have anyone see her off. Along with Anita were other Jewish children of all ages, some as young as two or three years old. Ninety percent of these children never saw their parents again. In England, Anita was sent to live with Mrs. Butcher. Butcher, an elderly woman who wanted a companion. Anita was always on her best for behavior for fear of being sent back to Austria. She lived a pleasant life in England considering her other option. Herta, her sister, was too old to take part in the kinder transport, but she was able to come to England as a maid, although she rarely lifted, although she rarely lifted a finger in her own home. <laughs> um, another English lady was sending papers to Austria to bring their mother over as a maid, but before the papers could reach their destination, the war broke out and Anita's mother was sent to a concentration camp. All Anita and Herta could do was wait and hope for the best. The war was over for four months, and it was on the eve of the Jewish New Year when Anita received a letter from the Red Cross. Her and her sister opened the letter with trembling fingers. This, con this letter contained the whereabouts of their parents. Both of their parents had survived the hell of concentration camps. They wanted to send, their send for their parents immediately, but they needed the means to do so. They sent coffee and cigarettes, which had high value in those days, to their parents in Austria so they could bribe their way into England. Once her parents were in England, they were hesitant to share details of their experience of the past years. They understood what it was like to have nothing, so they no longer desired lavish things. Anita Weisbord saw some of the horrors of Hitler firsthand. It's irrefutable fact. 
yet there are those out there in today's day and age completely denying the Holocaust. For instance, starting in 1942, the Jews began circulating rumors that they were all being killed. These rumors filtered through various new agencies from various sources. By 1945, the Jews had forged tens of thousands of Nazi, Nazi documents, all proving that the Nazis had committed mass murder. The Jews invented the whole thing in a whirlwind effect. They invented the places where the gassings took place. They researched and invented the techniques that were used. They forged photographs and wove them into the document, documentary record. These are the thoughts of modern-day revisionists or Holocaust deniers. They have heard the same stories we have and seen the same pictures as us, yet they deny the Holocaust in its entirety. To us, the, har the Holocaust is a heartbreaking, indisputable, indisputable event that happened in our grandparents' generation. Yet there are those filled with such hate and ignorance that they can deny what we have proof of. Without Mrs. Weisbord and everyone who endured the unfathomable tragedies of the Holocaust, we would have no attestation. Thank you, Mrs. Weisbord, for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me and tell you, tell me your story, your proof. I promise to tell my story to, you, to my children. <laughs> okay, very good, thank you. Let me ask you, uh, Nina, uh, and I ask the same, I'll ask the same question to every student here. Uh, you spent a good deal of time with Ms. Weisbord, you got her story, you reacted, you wrote a very good response to what you had, but what would you remember most? Let's say 15 years from now, if you think back to when you were in the Holocaust Center here, and you think back to the time that you met Ms. Weisbord and you interviewed her, what do you think would stand out in your mind? Um, I think what stood out to me most is when um, Mrs. Weisbord told me that um, she was sitting on the train and her mom was on the uh, platform seeing her off and just waiting, waiting for her to leave and she, like, the, the thought of that haunts her and she can't bear, like, if she's going away, she, she can't have anyone see her off, so I think that story really impacted me. Anita, will you have anything that you would like to add? Uh, what amazes me that the second student who interviewed me never heard about the kindergarten sport before. That seems to be one story which seems to be such a secret, but it's part of history and I think it's an important part because I know we didn't go to the hall of the camps like so many of the survivors, but I think any child, some of them were two-year-old and three-year-old, who had no idea what happened to them, just quiet for their mothers. It's not easy to go to a country, you don't know the language, you don't know who's going to take care of you, and you don't know if you're ever going to see, out of those 10,000 children were saved, 90% never saw their parents again. But uh, we all made productive lives. Some of them stayed in England, some went to America like I did, some went to Israel, and the majority are well, like I have two children, four grandchildren, they're all doing well. And I remember one Thanksgiving we were together and I told them we should each say what we're thankful for. So when it came to me, I looked at them, I said, I'm thankful that I survived the Holocaust, otherwise I wouldn't have you. And that really had a tremendous impact on my grandchildren. They know my story. I had to talk at their school, their Hebrew school, and they're very much aware of what happened. Okay, thank you. Thank you.